once again how God does this. It's one thing I love about Wow Church is the way that the God speaks to the individuals who speak up here and the one who speaks through the music. Right, Randy? Um, there have been, my sermon has been preached three times this morning before I ever got up here because they're all saying the exact same thing and now I'm going to put scripture to what they've been saying, right? Um, and I love how that... I have to tell you a story about that uh, Big Daddy Weave song, though. I, I look songs up all the time, and when artists come out with new songs, I like to know where they came from. Uh, Zach Williams, who a lot of you know, has written Rescue, Rescue Story, uh, Old Church Choir, a bunch of those songs, um, was... Uh, got saved about five years ago. Uh, what you may not know is uh, he, was, uh, he was already a rocker, so he was doing a tour, uh, doing what I call whiskey music, right? Whiskey rock and roll. He was doing that in um, Europe, and he was driving down the road. He had been thinking about uh, things that were wrong in his life and thinking about how his whole life kind of took a wrong turn and uh, he flipped on a Christian radio station as they were driving in a van down the road in Europe and Big Daddy Weave's song came on Redeemed and at the end of that song he asked Jesus to be a savior Amen. he came home and everything changed okay He's written songs that we enjoy now. Well, check this out. Big Daddy Weave, a year ago, was having a hard time writing lyrics to new songs. They just had hit a blockade, couldn't do it. Zach Williams called them up, called Mike Weaver up, and he said, Hey, by the way, I got a song that I think's got your name all over it. And he says, Really? It was that Alive song? that became a great seller for them and it is a great story for us. And he basically gave them that song in the day that songwriters all want money for their songs. He said, you don't know what your songs did for me all those years ago, here's a song. Isn't that cool? And you think God ain't all over that? I, I just thought it was beautiful, it's a beautiful story. And uh, it just goes to show God is ultimately in control. Amen. All right. Um, so, this may shock you, but I got my sermon on Tuesday this week. It wasn't Thursday. All right. It wasn't Friday. It was Tuesday. And one of the reasons I got it was I was listening to the Bible. I told you I've been listening to the Bible, right? Well, on Tuesday, I was on Exodus 33 and Exodus 34 in the Old Testament. And I'm listening to it. And right, I mean, the guy is reading it. And all of a sudden, he says something. And when he does, I went, oh, my gosh, there's the sermon for this week. And so I've been thinking about it all week long. I've been looking forward to sharing it with you. And uh, so it's Exodus 33, verse 12 is where we'll start. Let me give you just a little background information. Moses has already led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses has already gotten the Ten Commandments. I don't know if you remember this, but in first part of Exodus, Moses says, God, I can't speak very good. I need somebody to be with me. And so he has Aaron, his brother, speak for him when they go into the presence of Pharaoh. And he says, let my people go. And he says this, you know, 10 times. And uh, what's interesting is, is Moses always relied on Aaron. Okay. Well, when he came down from the Ten Commandments, and if you've ever seen the movie, I love it. I love the old Cecil B. DeMille movie, right? Where he throws the tablets down, right, and they break. Why does he throw the tablets down? Because the people of Israel are sinning, and Aaron has led them into sin. One of my favorite lines in the whole Bible is a lie. And you go, what? No, it's because that's how good we are at lying, right? 
Aaron tells the people, they say, we want to idol. Moses ain't coming down from the mountain. We're tired of waiting on Moses. We want to worship something, and we'll say, this led us out of Israel. And Aaron says, bring me all your gold, all your earrings, all your stuff, and I will make you a calf out of gold to worship. That's what Aaron said. It's documented. It's right here. But when Moses breaks the tablets after coming down out of the mountain after 40 days, he looks at Aaron and he says, what's going on? And Aaron says, the people were upset because you weren't here and they brought me all their gold and I threw it in the fire and all of a sudden this calf jumped out. <laughs> How many of you ever told a story like that? And what did your mama say? You liar. <laughs> anyway. So the reason I tell you that story is from that day forward, Moses by himself always went to God. He didn't take Aaron with him. All right? So this will make more sense when I dive into this, right? Chapter 33, verse 12. One day Moses said to the Lord, now he's on top of the mountain. He's actually been talking to the Lord, or he's been talking to the Lord for probably two weeks now. He's been up there. And by the way, every time Moses goes on the mountain, he doesn't eat. Just like Jesus all the time would say, I have food that you know nothing of, right? It's the spiritual food from heaven. The Spirit of God actually feeds him. That's how important the Word of God is, and we need to understand that. All right, so one day Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. See, he was used to Aaron being by his side. Aaron now has been given a whole nother job. That's to minister in the tabernacle, right? Who's going to go with me? You have told me I know you by name and I look favorable on you. If it is true that you look favorable on me, let me know your ways so my I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses. Is that cool? That's when I knew I had the sermon. I literally am listening on my phone and he said that. And I knew it was there. But when somebody's reading that to you, see, just the way I read it to you and you responded, that's what I did on Tuesday. Right? I went, what? <laughs> Rewind. <laughs> anyway. I will personally go with you, Moses. And I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Now that's kind of, we have a tendency to think that means we won't have any problems. Do you know Moses fought five different wars before they got to the promised land? So did he have problems? Of course he had problems. Do you know that the children of Israel rebelled against God about three more times? And about 10,000 of them died before they got to the promised land. Plus, the whole group that came out that were old all died before they got there. So it's not like there wasn't any problems. But, he says, everything will be fine for you. In other words, I will help you go through these problems. Right? The Lord replied, or then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. You see that? What is he really saying? God, if you're not going to go with us, why are we going to the promised land at all? If you're not going to be with me, then I don't want to go. Amen. You see that? How will anyone know, watch this, how will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and our people, if you don't go with us? Now, are you starting to hear what I was hearing when I was listening? Jesus said a lot of these same words, okay? 
Watch this. For your presence among us set your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. You want to know how Austin preached my sermon? He said, the God who makes the sun come up actually lives in me. That's the same thing. When people look, when you look favorably on me, then people know that you're in me. How did Chris preach the sermon? The sack and the bag of Oreos. I should look like what's in me. Amen. Right? Same sermon. Uh, Melissa in the first service said basically the same thing. The songs that were being sung basically say the same thing. Now watch this. Uh, for I look favorably on you and I know you. Okay, the Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked for, for I look favorably on you and I know you by name. Number one, do you notice Moses asked God for something and God responds by giving him that something. Why is that? Because Moses was asking from all of his heart I don't want to go anywhere that you are not. And I only want to go where you're going. Yes. See, when people say, I don't understand when I pray, how come God don't answer my prayer? It's because you're asking bad prayers. Yes. Right. And you say, Why? what do you mean a bad prayer? They're selfish. Yeah. God, I need a million dollars to pay my bills. And God's going, you've been working for 20 years. You've already made a million dollars. Why hadn't you paid your bills? <laughs> Amen. Uh, huh? Yeah. God, I need a place to live. How come you don't give me a place to live? Because you screwed up the four places you he'd already given you to live the last five years. Yes. Amen. See, you're, you're praying possessively. You're praying, uh, how do you call it, uh, selfishly. When we pray, we need to pray in God's will. We need to pray for things that God is all about. Yes, amen. Like, God, I want to know you more. Yes. Then read his word yes. and you will know him more. Yes. There are things you have to do. See, all relationships are reciprocal. I do something, you do something. If I'm in marriage with my wife, who's not sitting here today, but this is where she usually sits, right? So I can kind of see her sitting there. I do something, and she does something. Now, I don't do something to get something. That's selfish. I love her unconditionally. Guess what happens? She loves me unconditionally. See, it's reciprocal. And we do the same thing with God. Why in the world do we need a genie? Why do we pray for, to God like he's a genie? Yes. No, we should pray for God, to God because we're in relationship with him. Okay? He gives me salvation. I share his name with everybody. Yes. Right? All right, watch this. Uh, the Lord replied, I will do indeed what you have asked for. I look favorably on you and I know you by name. Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. See, he didn't say, give me a million dollars. He said, then show me who you are. You know, while I was going through the cancer stuff, let me tell you, God and I was having communication every day because when you feel like you're going to die, yeah. you have this relationship with God like no other time. Right. Have, have you ever seen that clip from the Mr. Rogers movie? Have you seen that? There's a clip. Uh, you know, uh, who is uh, the actor? Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks plays Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers was a Christian, by the way, who lived in Hollywood, which is kind of odd. But he affected two generations of people. Well, in one of the clips, it says he's walking away from this house and the guy's interviewing him. He says, uh, why did you have that guy pray for you? He said, because that guy has suffered a long time in his illness, and I figure anybody who suffered like that has a relationship with God, and I want him to pray for me. Amen. See, we're not supposed to get mad at God when we're suffering. We're supposed to turn to God when we're suffering. 
Have you ever looked at this as Moses was suffering? This guy had to take care of a million people. And they don't want to go. So Moses has to rely on God. Watch this. Then show me your glorious presence. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. Stop. When you received Jesus into your heart, did he not show you compassion? Amen. Did he not show um, mercy? Right? He gave it to you. Praise Jesus. And there would be people in my life back in the day when that happened to me would say, he's not deserving of that. Why did you give him salvation, God? He's a piece of crap. Mm -hmm. Come on, Ray. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. See, because God shows mercy on whoever he chooses. By the way, when you read the Bible through and through, you begin to see all the knuckleheads or who rise to the top yeah. and become something for God. And it's the religious people that fall short. Amen. We need to pay attention to that. Why does God have mercy on you? Because he sees things on you that nobody else sees. That's right. Because he's involved in you with creation, right? Goes back to what you said. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live, the Lord continued. Look, stand near me on this rock as my glorious presence passes by. I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. How would you like to have written that in the Bible? Do you know Moses wrote Exodus? So this is autobiographical this is him writing his story you don't see that a lot of places in the Bible but he's literally saying God grabbed me shoved me in the crack of the rock and walked by you know when you ask Jesus into your heart he's done the same thing Jesus embodies he is in you through the Holy Spirit we forget that all right watch this uh, then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face you will not see. Now, I had somebody come up after the first service and say, why didn't he look at him directly? And I thought, you know what? I don't know that I've ever answered that question for somebody. So that's a good question. It's because God's face is so pure and we have sin on us and God's purity, if it were to walk in the room right now, we would all disintegrate. Yeah. Yeah. The reason God hid his face from Moses was because he loved Moses that much. Not to kill him by just looking at him. You want to talk about favor? How many times in my life have I sinned and thought, God, you should just kill me? That was despicable, what I just did. Yeah. Yet, what does God do? But, Jim, I'm going to show you mercy so that you will show others mercy. Yes. Yeah. Right? Those who are forgiven much, love much. That's what Jesus said. Yeah, All right, now, you go, okay, Jim, that's good stuff. That's fun. Well, let's look at John chapter 14, 9. Now, i got to tell you something. What had happened about two weeks before that is God had given Moses the old covenant, the original covenant. All right? Now watch what happens in uh, John 14, 9. I want to, we got to hit this. Now, the disciples, Jesus is telling them he's fixing to die. He's fixing to go to the cross. I, I have got to go suffer, but in three days I'll raise, so just hang around Jerusalem because I'll come back. And they're going, what? Right? They don't understand. 
And so Philip says, Lord, just show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus in chapter, or, uh, chapter 14, verse 9 says, Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Amen. Okay, that's the bridge between what I just showed you in Scripture in Exodus, and that's the bridge between what I'm going to show you now. Now this is Matthew. This is just before Jesus ascends. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach the new disciples to obey all the commandments. And by the way, that's love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's Jesus' way of saying the sa exact same thing that Yahweh said to Moses. Guys, we have a tendency to look at Moses as if he's way up here and we're down here groveling in the, groveling in the dust. Do you know because of Jesus dying for our sins, us receiving Him into our hearts, the Holy Spirit coming in and dwelling in us makes us equal with Moses. Amen. Amen. Moses is not up here. Now in the Old Testament, Moses is up here. But in the New Testament, we are completely qualified and you go, where do you get that? Who appeared with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. Who else was standing there? Peter, James, and John. They're equal with Moses and Elijah. And who's standing there with his arms around them probably? I think Jesus in that situation, I think Jesus, all of a sudden those two guys showed up and and Peter, James, and John are like, oh my gosh, what is happening? I think, I think Jesus went, hey boys, it's good to see you. Old and new. Yes. Now, here's the plan, huddle up. We have a tendency not to see what was actually happening there. He was qualifying them and he was saying in, through the Spirit of God, you are the same to me. Right? Now what I want you to see in this is if we pray a prayer like Moses prayed you think God's not going to answer that? Yeah, God has answered that to me. I'm going to try to say this without crying. I remember one time several years ago my father-in-law asked me to pray over supper. You would think, I've, we've done that a hundred times, no big deal. That particular week, I had been studying about the presence of God. And I had asked him several times in the week, God, would you just let me see your glory? I stood up, we're eating on the back deck of the house, all the food is set out, all the family's there, and I went, Father, in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, I got this vision of Jesus standing at the head of the table and said, my people, my people. And I'm looking at him and I'm going, and I just start, I just keep praying. I just keep praying. But it's like I can't stop talking because I'm like Peter at the Mount of Transfiguration. I just start babbling <laughs> because there's God standing right there. Yeah. And I'm praying and about, at about that time, I think five minutes went by. You know, the food's getting cold. And, and all of a sudden, Michelle jerks on my shirt. I said, Jim, amen. 
I'm like, I don't want to stop what's happening. I don't want to. And that, but they weren't a part of it. They were there. But he was doing it to me because I had asked him. They weren't seeing what I was seeing. Man, all of a sudden, I didn't care about food. I didn't care about them. I just was with God. Right? And you go, well, Jim, you're special. No, I'm not. I am just like you. I just asked him to reveal himself to me. Because I had been seeking it. And he showed up. And I'll never forget that one day during that last chemo that was just kicking my tail terrible. I was literally, I, I don't know, I don't know if I've made this as clear to you. But I knew the devil had been on me for two days just saying, just give up. And I knew, I told Michelle, I said, if I don't get off of this chemo, I'm going to die. And she said, I know, Jim. I said, but I don't know what to do. And the devil kept telling me, just give up, just give up. And I told you about that because when you give up physically in your mind, if you ever tell yourself, I give up physically, I don't care how healthy you are, you die soon. It's a proven fact. When people lose their will to live, they die. And I said, God, am I supposed to go forward in this thing or not? And this was his answer. And I heard him plain as day, just like he was whispering in my ear, Jim, just tell the devil who you are. So I went, what? Just tell the devil who you are. And I started saying, I am a child of the king. I have been bought with a price. I am royalty. I am a child of the Father. I am the firstborn of creation. And I started going down the list of all these things. All of a sudden, the devil was gone. All of a sudden, I told Michelle, I said, I'm ready for the surgery. God has showed me it's going to save my life. And praise God, because the surgery is coming, I get to get off of chemo tomorrow. And all of a sudden, I start to get better. People ask me all the time, they say, how you feel? I'm 60 years old. In two months, I will be 61. This is how I answer. I feel better than I did when I was 50. Now, my point to that is what God showed me by telling me to tell the devil that, he was telling me my time on earth is not through. And he was saying, I got some more stuff for you to do. Trust me, but continue to seek me. Right? And there I will be. And so guys, that's the way we need to be living our lives, especially in this generation. There are so many things up in the air, so many different ways our country could go in the next 20 years. It's not even funny. The only way you're going to be able to withstand anything is you got to know that relationship with God. And a lot of people think it's having a good relationship with the preacher or having a good relationship with that gal that you know that's such a prayer warrior. It's you having a relationship with God. Amen. And Him wanting to show you His presence. Yes. And you responding to his presence. That's what changes everything. When you read the stories of the disciples, every one of those guys died a tragic death. Yet every one of them had no problem facing that death because they were in the presence of God. Yes. When people in third world countries give their life to Jesus, 90% of the time they're in Muslim countries, which means they will immediately lose their standing in their family. Why do they become Christians anyway? Because they're in the presence of God and they recognize it. Amen. Right? Amen. We Americans, because we have everything given to us, we have such a tendency to take his presence lightly. No. No. 
It's the most precious thing Americans should be looking for. So, all of this was to say, seek the presence of God. He will reveal himself to you and it will fulfill you more than any other thing. Be thinking about these things as we go into this reflection time. Anybody need to come pray with me? Go ahead.